I get a cold. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Anyways. Okay, so we've been talking about, uh, so we're in the midst of talking about identical particles, uh, systems of identical particles. And last time we talked about maybe the simplest uh, real world example of a system of identical particles, which is the helium atom. And so in this case, uh, you have two electrons, which are identical. Um, and you have a nucleus, but the nucleus just basically serves as a, you know, source of an external field uh, for us. We don't really have to take into account dynamics of, of the nucleus or anything. We're just focusing on the electrons. Um, and we wanted to try to tackle this problem and solve for, uh, what were we trying to solve for? The, the, we were trying to construct the wave function, right, and then compute the ground state energy, right? So for the case where both electrons are in the lowest uh, possible uh, level. And so we started by writing that down the Hamiltonian, right, which includes uh, the interaction of each of the electrons with uh, the, um, the uh, nucleus, right? And then there's also this interaction term between the electrons, uh, which really complicates things uh, we saw. So the first thing we did was we just neglected that interaction and see what we got, right? In that case, you can split the the wave function of the two electron system into two one electron system, basically hydrogen atom uh, with a shift in the Z uh, number. And so there we tried to construct uh, basically the wave function, right? And we saw that if we wanted to put both of these particles, both of these electrons in the lowest energy level, that means we have to be in the spin singlet state, right? Because we have to construct for fermions, we have to construct a an totally anti-symmetric uh, wave function. And if they're both in the ground state, uh, then that's automatically symmetric. So we have to put them in the, in the um, spin singlet state. And that just goes back to the to Pauli exclusion principle and stuff that you've learned about, you know, your whole life in physics, right? So we wrote down the wave function. We were able to compute the ground state energy and we found that we were off by about 30%, right, which is not good. Um, I mean, it's not orders of magnitude off, but uh, which happens, you know, in, real, in the real world. Uh, typically, your first stab at trying to compute things, you're normally off by orders of magnitude, and then you go back and you find problems and errors and uh, things you did, you know, very, uh, stupid things you did. But this is, uh, so we're only, we're only off by, you know, a factor of three, uh, but it's still, you know, the, like I, like you, we said, the helium atom by this point has been uh, studied uh, extensively. And so we want to try to do better than that. And so what it's telling us is that that term that we neglected uh, really is important. Okay. And but once you include that, that prop, that part of the uh, interaction, the problem uh, becomes uh, very hard to solve. Right. And so what we did was we resorted to approximation techniques. We used perturbation theory, right? And we computed the first order energy shift. The tricky part is the radial uh, integral because you have this term in the interaction that depends on R1 and R2 kind of non-trivially, right? And it depends on the relative angle between uh, the electrons where they are uh, uh, in space. But there's some tricks you can use and, and you know, eventually do the, this integral and then when we put it all back together and we plugged in the numbers, we found that we were a lot closer. So we were within 5%. So we applied the perturbation theory uh, using uh, on this interaction term and, and found that we can get within 5%. Uh, but then we said, okay, well, is there any better, you know, can we do better? And, and the question, per, and, you know, the answer to perturbation theory would be, well, that mean we're going to have to compute second order uh, uh, energy shift, right? which is not too difficult, okay? But you could go and do that, <clears throat> or you could try to use the variational method, which is what we did. In that case, you guess a, a, a trial wave function, right? And then you compute the expectation value of your Hamiltonian with respect to that trial wave function. And then you um, optimize or minimize, uh, I guess optimize is the better word, uh, on you know parameters that you introduce, right? And so in this case, we, we reasoned that 
you know, the Z, the, the, the number of protons that the electron sees is going to be smaller, right? It's going to be because it's, it's being screened by the other electron, right? And so we use uh, Z effective as our kind of free parameter, right? And we, like we said, we expected Z, effect, Z effective to be smaller than Z, right? So what we did was we just basically wrote down uh, a way, the a product of two hydrogen atom wave functions, right? And everywhere we had Z, we replaced it with Z effective. And then we went off and computed this thing, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. It involves some nasty math, but again, you can, there's, you know, um, the, the kinetic part and the potential part from the helium nucleus isn't, aren't, you know, it's, it's not that tough. And then the other integral turned out to be the one that we computed b before for perturbation theory. So we just used the results, right? And what we found was that, um, so, okay, so we uh, we computed that expectation value. We got this thing, right? And then the next step is to minimize this uh, with respect to the Z effective. And so we went through that process, and we ended up finding that using this variational method, we can get within 1% of the true ground state energy, okay? And that was um, pretty impressive, right? Um, okay, and I think that's and that's where we ended, right? And so what I want to do today is to consider, uh, so that was the case of both electrons in the ground state. Now I want to consider the case of what happens when one of those electrons is in an excited state, right? So I still have one of the uh, electrons in the ground state, but one of, these part of, one of these electrons is in the excited state. Okay, just because it's now, you know, now just because it's out of, not, they're not at the same level, uh, doesn't mean that, you know, all this stuff about identical particles and symmetries and stuff, we can just toss out the window. We still have to, you know, ensure that, uh, you know, we write down an anti-symmetric uh, total wave function, okay? Because, again, we can't, we don't know which electron, you know, we, it's not like classical physics. We don't know that electron one is the one that's in the ground state and electron two is the one that's excited. It could be either one, right, or some linear combination of the two. <clears throat> All right, so so we're going to write down uh, our spatial wave function, much like we did before. Except now, uh, so you remember uh, when we were doing the the ground state, they were both in the one zero zero state. So it was just one choice, right? It was to, it was um, automatically symmetric because it was just the product of those two. Here we have some freedom because now we can uh, write the spatial wave functions either in a symmetric way, right, which would be the linear combination of, uh, let's say, particle one in the ground state, particle two in the excited state, or particle two in the ground state, particle one in the excited state. Okay, so, uh, and we can um, put these in either in a symmetric or an anti-symmetric state, right, depending on the spin state. Okay, and what we want to do is, again, we want to try to compute uh, the, uh, the energy of this system uh, using perturbation theory, okay? So we know, uh, <clears throat> for example, we know what the, 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 the electron of the, what, you know, one of the electrons in the ground state, and, and we know the energy of the electron in the excited state. What we're looking for is that piece of the interaction or that piece of the uh, total energy that comes from their interaction, okay? So these numbers we know, right? We could just treat them as, it's like we did before. We just treat it like uh, separate hydrogen atoms, right? With, with the Z equals two. Okay, and so so this first order energy shift is again, uh, it's uh, coming from this interaction term between the two electrons. Okay, and what I want to do. So what I want to do is I want to compute this thing. Remember, the, the energy shift doesn't. Um, uh, I'll say it like this, it doesn't explicitly depend on the spin, right? So all we really need are the spatial parts, okay? Uh, and so what I, what I would do is I would take uh, this, this wave function and plug it in here, right? And what I want to do is break this, you know, so, so we, we would have to foil this out, multiply it out. And um, what I want to do is break it into pieces, right? I want to break it into one, one piece that I call I and one piece that I call J. I is what we call the direct integral. It's more like, you know, what we would expect uh, in, you know, in the case that, uh, that we can identify 
the particles, I guess you would say, right? <coughs> and J is the part that's coming from uh, this exchange uh, symmetry, right? So it's the part that's uh, coming from having to consider particle one in the ground state, particle two in the, in the mixed state or the higher state, and then the, you know, vice versa uh, version of that, okay? So, so the plus minus, again, is coming from this plus minus up here, all right? So it's going to depend on um, if the, you know, so, you know, whatever the symmetry of this thing is, it, it dictates the symmetry of the spin state, or you can think of it as the spin state, you know, the, the symmetry of the spin state dictates the spin, the, the state of the, the, the symmetry of the spatial, right? <clears throat> so that's why I said earlier that, you know, the way that we write down this wave function or, or the way that we uh, compute the energy shift doesn't depend explicitly on spin. You don't see like spin operators in there. You don't see, you know, the spin wave functions in there, but it does indirectly uh, de determine the energy shift, right? Because it, it dictates which uh, spatial wave function you write down. Okay. So, um, so again, uh, the plus sign here is coming. So that's this, the symmetric spatial wave function. And if the spatial wave functions, uh, symmetric, then we know we have to go with the spin singlet, right? So the, the, the particles or the electrons have to be spin up, spin down, uh, anti-symmetric. And the minus sign goes, uh, with the anti-symmetric spatial state. So that means we can go, or we have to go with the spin triplet. Okay. And you can see that obviously that uh, because these all this stuff is squared, right? That uh, I is positive definite. Okay, so that remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to compute this energy shift, right? So we can identify already that <clears throat> if it was just I alone, it's going to raise the energy, right? From what we would expect from this kind of unperturbed, uh, you know, so this value, right? It's going to raise it from from here to there, right? And then you look at J and you see that J, uh, you can actually uh, show that it's also positive definite, right? So that means that if you have uh, a symmetric wave, a symmetric spatial wave function, then it's going to be raised by I and then plus J, right? Whereas if you have an anti-symmetric spatial wave function, if you have uh, the spin triplet, the... Uh, the energy is raised by I, and then it's lowered by J, right? So it's it's not as high, okay? I have a picture here. Yeah, here's my picture, okay? So we start out with just the unperturbed energy, right? And then when we compute these uh, energy shifts, we see that I shifts it upwards, right? Because it's positive definite, and then J is also positive definite, but depending on the spin state that you're in, uh, it's going to dictate what the uh, perturbed energy level is, okay? So if you're in uh, spin singlet, which means you have a, uh, a, um, a symmetric wave function or symmetric spatial wave function, you get the plus sign, right? <clears throat> so if you're, uh, uh, what was I going to say? So if you're in a singlet, right, uh, you get the you get the plus sign. And it, and it and the energy grows, right? The energy is the highest that you can get from this from this interaction, and that makes sense because if the particles are in a singlet state, then they're going to want to. We saw last time do that exchange degen exchange degeneracy term. They're going to want to try to be closer together, right? And if they're closer together, that ramps up the uh, the uh, the Coulomb interaction between the two, so it raises the energy of the system, right? Whereas if you're in a spin triplet, um, uh, then the particles, uh, the particles want to be, uh, want to, uh, be further away from each other. Right. I think I say this in words here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so in the singlet case, the spatial wave function symmetric, the electrons, uh, have an enhanced chance of being closer together, right? And so their energy is I plus J, right? Where I and J are positive definite. And if you're in a spin triplet state, spatial wave function is anti-symmetric, right? And the chance of the electrons being close together is drastically reduced. And so the electrostatic repulsion between those two plays a lesser role, right? So you're closer uh, to being 
just raised by I, right? And that's why I have this note here that uh, these two J's aren't necessarily the same value, right? So you could, uh, depending on um, uh, depending on the situation, um, right? So this is I think I, th I thought I put a note. Oh yeah, so this um, these these different states go by uh, are, are are you know typically called uh, perihelium and orthohelium, which you might have heard of before. Uh, when you're in the spin singlet state, so that's a spin, spin singlet, which means that the electrons, um, what is it? Is it the electron, so the, the energy is the highest. Right? That's perihelium. And when it's in the spin triplet case, it's called orthohelium. I don't, don't ask me why uh, it's called para and ortho. I don't remember. Uh, but the, that's just the, the origin of the terms. Okay, so you'll hear. Uh, you know, you might hear this applied to not only helium, but also other types of atoms, right? Like, so you might hear of para lithium or para, you know, carbon or something. I don't know. I'm not a chemist. Um, thank God. Uh, that was a joke. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, so in general, again, the highest state's called perihelium. The lower state's called orthohelium. Um, and then, and just this note again that, you know, even though the Hamiltonian isn't explicitly spin dependent, right, we can still see that there's effects from these particles having spins, right, because the spins determine, you know, the spins combined with the uh, Pauli exclusion principle uh, and the Fermi Dirac st uh, statistics and all that stuff, it determines, you know, how you write down the spatial wave function, right? And the spatial wave function is what dictates. Uh, the energy levels of, of, the, of an atom, okay? And, yeah, so these are just some notes. Uh, electrons with spins aligned have lower energy configuration, right? So if you align all the spins, uh, and so this obviously has implications for uh, ferromagnets. So who, is it, who's in condensed matter? Any of you guys? Okay, okay. okay. What, uh, what else do you guys do? You're with Dr. Huda, right? So, th so this, yeah, so that's condensed, it's kind of condensed matter. Yeah. So if or when you take condensed matter, uh, you'll study these systems of uh, ferromagnets and, and phase transitions and all this cool stuff, okay? <clears throat> all right, so, uh, so that's at the end of our discussion of two particle, or two, uh, yeah, two particle states with fermions. Any questions so far? My voice is hanging in there. I don't know how much longer I can go. <clears throat> All right, so uh, so if we want to move beyond two particles, like I was telling you guys earlier, uh, you can do that. We can extend everything that we've done so far as far as constructing. Uh, so, so when I say in particles, I mean... Uh, identical particles, okay? Uh, beyond, so we can extend this beyond the case of two identical particles. And what we would do is we would just basically start gluing together more and more single particle states, right? And what we could still do is define some uh, permutation operator, right? And then uh, uh, play all the same games, right? Play, we, you know, uh, enforce the fermions are anti-symmetric and, uh, you know, systems of bosons are symmetric, right? And this projection operator is going to have the same properties as, as the one that we're used to, right? So it's still exchanging uh, two particles, right? And so if we exchange two particles and then exchange them again, we should get back the, the original state, right? So that's telling us that the eigenvalues of this thing are, are plus or minus one, just like it did before. However, when you go beyond uh, two particles, it's not necessarily true that these uh, projection operators are going to commute, right? So you could do one, you know, one flop and then another flop, right? And you might not get back, um, and then do it the opposite direct, you know, way, and might not you might not necessarily get the uh, the same state back, right? So let me show you. Uh, so the case here. <coughs> So let's work out uh, the case of three uh, identical particles, right? 
And so we'll have one particle with uh, K prime, one particle with K double prime, and one particle with triple prime, okay? And these particles are identical. So in general, uh, if we wanted to write this, you know, uh, these, these states down in a symmetric or anti-symmetric way, there's uh, three factorial ways of doing that. In other words, six possible states, right? So there's a six-fold. So for this particular case, there would be a six-fold degeneracy, right? So you have the state, and say K is, you know, the quantum number that determines the energy, then you would have six, you know, distinct states that have the same energy, okay? However, uh, so that's the case where you have basically, I guess, Maxwell Boltzmann's uh, statistics, like so, so identical uh, identical particles that you can uh, that you can identify that you can you know uh, place the labels on and follow right. But in quantum, we have to deal with either totally symmetric or totally anti-symmetric states, and so that that limits the way that we can write down uh, our states, right? And so it turns out that there's really only one uh, possible linear combination. Uh, for writing down this state. So this is just kind of shorthand notation. I put all the Ks in, inside of one ket. Uh, and we still define these with plus or minus. So plus is being symmetric. Right? So you see all these. And basically, these just come from exchanging different part, you know, different uh, kets. Okay? So see the plus or minus sign. The plus, again, would be uh, what we would call symmetric. You would pick all the plus signs or you would pick all the minus signs. Right? Um, right, so you can also, I mean, it makes sense that if you can define a permutation operator that, that changes two particles, you can define a permutation operator that changes three particles, right? It exchanges three particles in some particular way, right? And it, that is always uh, basically equivalent to just the product of two exchanges, right? So you do one exchange, you do another one, and that's the same as if you had wrote down one operator that does all three. Uh, or changes all three particles at the same time. Um, right, and then you can see that if any of these indices are the same, right, so if I set K double prime to K prime, what you're going to find is that the minus sign, if you took the minus sign, this wave function is going to collapse, or this, this state gets going to collapse. And that's because you're dealing with anti-symmetric wave function, means you're dealing with fermions, and so that means you have to... Um, obey the Pauli exclusion principle, right? So if you try to put two of the particles in the same state, wave function collapses, okay? That's just, what, it's exactly what we saw in the, in the, in the uh, two particle case. Remember there, we only had two terms, right? And our total wave function was plus or minus. And if we tried to take one particle and put it in, you know, in the same state as the other, that minus sign ensured that those two terms canceled off, right? Just look back at the notes from last time. Okay, so so that's how uh, you, you know you can, like we said, um, when you're dealing with particles or systems with uh, more than two particles, you can apply all that same stuff that we've done, right? But you can see that already, just at n equals three, when I try to write down the wave function of the state cut, I already have to write down six terms, right? And so you can imagine when I go to four. It'd be four factorial, which is what, 24, right? So you'd have 24 terms, right? And then five factorial, which is 120, I think, something like that, yeah. Um, so you would have to have, you know, these, these wave functions are gonna get uh, out of control really fast, right? And typically in real world situations, we're dealing with 10 to the 23 uh, particles, you know, Av Avogadro's number, right? So uh, this type of, um, approach is, you know, it makes no sense, right, in the real world, okay, uh, to try to apply. Uh, it's, it's great for the classroom, you know, it's great for, uh, you know, when you're dealing with ideal situations where you have one or two particles. Uh, but when you go to systems with, like I said, 10 to the 23 particles, um, the, you know, you're, you're going to be out of luck, right? It's going to be really tough. All right, so what we want to do, uh, or what people did, was invent this kind of new way of dealing with multi-particle systems, and it goes by this name, uh, second quantization, okay, and at, when you hear that term, it's kind of mysterious, and you're like, wait, what's the second thing that we're, quant you know, that we're quantizing? I, I, 
and what was the first one? I don't even know what the first one was, right? Uh, it turns out it's kind of a misnomer. It's one of those things where uh, somebody developed it and they called it second quantization for some weird reason. And, you know, it's not really quantizing on top of quantizing. It's just a different way of working with multi-particle systems, okay? Uh, but we call it second quantization just for historical reasons. Okay, so... <coughs> Um, and so this is the way that we're going to deal with uh, identical particles. And then in this case, we don't try to keep track of, you know, uh, all the different K primes, right? The part, part the, you know, this particle has K prime, and this particle has K double prime, but we have to consider some linear combination. No, what we do is we deal with uh, a ket that looks like this, okay? So our ket would be one, it's one big ket, right? And each of these slots correspond to a value of K prime, okay? So what we do in this, in the second quantization is not keep track of, you know, the total wave function with a bunch of K prime or K double primes glued together. We say, okay, we have this um, system and uh, uh, we have so many particles with K prime, so many particles with K double prime, and so on and so forth, right? And so this is our... This is the cat that we work with, okay? Um, so if I had a system of fermions, what would that cat, what are the possible values that these entries have? Remember, they correspond to a particular state. One or zero. One or zero, right? Because I can't put more, if these are, if these are uh, distinct states, right? I can't put more than one particle in, okay? So for systems of fermions, you're gonna have a bunch of ones and zeros. It's gonna look like binary code, right? But in the case of uh, bosons, we'll see, you can pile a bunch of those into those, uh, th I like to call them buckets, right? So you have, you just, as you think of this thing as, uh, you know, kind of a big thing of buckets, and you're putting particles that are in one particular state in bucket one, and all the particles that are in another state in bucket two. So you just keep track of the number of particles that are in that state, in that in, in, in a particular state. Okay, and this new state vector, which we'll we'll come back to next time, uh, is uh, it's a it's a new uh, space we're working in. It's called Fox space, uh, which you might have heard of before. Um, <clears throat> but the uh, the basic idea you'll see, uh, basic it comes from. Uh, it's a lot like the simple harmonic oscillator, right? It's a lot like, so you can think of these as, uh, you know, if I just had like one, of the, if I just had one bucket, you're going to see the mathematics is just like what it was when we developed the simple harmonic oscillator, right? So you can think of this thing as a, um, a multi-dimensional uh, simple harmonic oscillator, okay? So you're going to see that we're going to define a number operator, Right, just like we did for the simple harmonic oscillator, and go from there, right? And define annihilation and creation operators, and those are gonna be, you know, creation operator is gonna put particles in different buckets, annihilation part, uh, operator is gonna take particles out of that bucket, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's not, uh, and it's a great, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, I, it's a beautiful formalism, and it leads you right into a lot of the stuff that you'll do in real life. Right, so uh, in real life, uh, this is kind of the basis for condensed matter physics, but also uh, quantum field theory or, or particle physics borrows a lot of ideas uh, from the, from this stuff. So it's it's really cool uh, stuff to work with. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. That was the end of these this set of notes, and, I, and my voice, my throat's really hurting. So uh, any questions about two particles, two particle systems? No? Okay, if you think of any, uh, feel free to email me or anything. Uh, and next time what we'll do is we'll pick up with these multi-particle system um, uh, and, and, and start to develop this formalism uh, for second quantization. There, uh, I just put a new homework in the Dropbox. I put a due date on it, but at this point in the semester, if you wanna, it's up to you. It just, just get it to me before the end of the semester. Okay, we're at that we're at that stage where 
I don't really care about due dates. Okay. So just get it done when you can. And, uh, you know, it's on, it's a second homework on scattering theory. So it's a little behind what we've, you know, what we've done. So you might have to go back and revisit some of those lectures that when we talked about, um, uh, what's it called? Partial wave analysis and all that stuff. Okay. But they're good problems. Uh, they're problems that I picked out of the old qualifier problems. Okay. So, so you get a taste of, uh, uh, you know, problems that might be on the qualifier if you still have to take the qualifier. Okay. All right. Have a good weekend. Thank you.